especially beginning at verse 1, which goes like this. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but the disciples who were doing the baptizing, he left Judea and went back to the Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by the journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noontime. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone into the city to buy some food. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said, Everyone who drinks of the water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to come, keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the man you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, mountain or in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvest. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper must rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one souls and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. 
and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The world. May God add his blessing on his reading of his word and on the readers who helped him today. Thank you, everybody. That was awesome. You need to give a little affirmation, guys. That was work. Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant me the gift of preaching. That the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to your beloved who are gathered here today, I ask that you granted them the gift of hearing. May our time be one in which we grow not only in our knowledge of you, but in our faith of believing you even if we don't see you, knowing that you are there and calling us with each step. I ask this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. The story of Jesus and the woman at the well is the longest recorded conversation Jesus had with one person in all four Gospels combined. In this particular story, Jesus is seeking to reveal himself to this Samaritan woman as she consistently erects barriers, attempting to drive him away. She finds countless things that get between her and him and is simply not engaging him. But Jesus is there, putting himself forward. And eventually, she accepts him at the well and into this morning during this season of Lent, this time of where we are to where God wants to be, this time of being confronted in our faith and seeing what God wants to do with us, opening ourselves to new possibilities, I want to look at these barriers that she put up. And I want to ask the question, what are the barriers that we put up that stop us from encountering and accepting Jesus every day in our lives? Now, at the time that this interaction took place uh, between, in Jesus' ministry, the land of Samaria, Samaria, as some of you may know, is like this little independent country stuck in the middle of the land of Israel. Um, it kind of divided the northern part from the southern part, and Jews did not want to intermix with Samaritans at any cost. They didn't like them. They didn't trust them. They didn't even want to be around them. They didn't want to breathe the same air as them. So instead of traveling the shortcut through Samaria to get from the Galilee to Jerusalem, they would take a six-day journey and go around the whole countryside, taking them down almost to the ocean and then back into the land. Jesus wanted to get home and get home quickly. So he took the shortcuts. There is a lot of cultural interaction going on in these 40-plus verses. And we can look at it and say, we understand it on the surface, but to really unlock it, I need to give you some history. So get comfortable. Here we go. Several hundred years before, right after the death of King Solomon, the nation of Israel split once again. The nation into two regions. You had the northern region, which was known as Israel, and the southern region that was known as Judea. The term Jew comes from the Judeans, which the Judeans practiced the religion according to Rome called Jewry, which is where we get the term Jew from. It's a southern term. It does not cover the totality of Israel. Samaria was this country to the north, and when the kings stopped worshiping God, started doing their own things, started to intermarry, started to practice pagan cults and religions, and look at, you know, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you see all the places where the kings kept intentionally turning away from God, despite the fact that God sent prophets to say, hey, if you all don't get your act together, as a king and as a nation, something bad's going to happen. And it did. 700 B.C. or so, the northern kingdoms were conquered by Assyria. And the Assyrian king took 
most of the people off into captivity. And those that he left, he brought seven tribes of Assyrians in their pagan idol worship and beliefs into that region to intermarry. The whole idea was to lessen the strength of the Jewish people, their faith, their religion, their culture, their identity. They wanted to get rid of them. They had become weak, these people, and they intermarried. They started to practice the pagan cultures and belief systems. They started to adapt to the new language. They started to become less Jewish and turn into something else. This hybrid people who still worshipped God had the first five books of the Old Testament is what we call the Samaritans. They believed in creation. They believed in the law. They believed in the presence and saving element of God, but any other writing that was put forward, they rejected. They did not read Psalms. They did not read Proverbs. They did not have the history of Kings and Chronicles. They did not have the beauty of the prophecies and how God would come back and interact. All they had was this limited focus of this is who what God was. And this went on for a couple hundred years until the southern kingdom was now conquered, Judea, by Babylon. And Babylon did several waves of deportation of the Jews over a period of time, and they took the strongest, the brightest, the more apt to rebel. They took them with them off to Babylon and left the tired, the sick, the elderly, any of those who had any gumption to rebuild Jerusalem and the southern kingdom weren't there. It was the do-nothing people that were left behind. Well, about this time, the whole region of Israel was, was known as Samaria. It was because of the intermingling, the inter intermarriaging. And this is how the world was recognizing at the time. For 70 years, it stayed this way. And then the king decided to send them back. Only the most zealous for God who chose not to give in to their foreign captive ways, who did not establish a new life, who held on to the hope and belief that they could return back to their homeland, the, the land of their forefathers, the land of God, the land that was promised to them. They went back to rebuild it. And they rebuild it, they did. Rebuilt their temple, rebuilt their culture, rewrote copies of their Torahs, their scriptures, rebuilt their synagogues, rebuilt their villages, in the south, in the north, except Samaria. Because by now, Samaria has become this hybrid, warped culture in the eyes of the Jews. And they had no desire to hear the way that God was calling them to grow and to change. So instead of beating their head against the wall, they just said, leave them be. We want nothing to do with them. This is the land that the Jews ignore. These are the people that they would hope time and God would forget. And this is exactly where Jesus has gone. It would be like going to a place that we would spend a lifetime wanting to avoid to take the message of God's love. That's where Jesus went. And there he encounters this woman at the well. A well created and given by their common ancestor, Jacob. There they sit. There they have this, this encounter. When I think about what's going on here, it's like the conversations I've had with so many, what we would call unchurched people, people that don't come to church, don't see the importance of church, but they believe that there's a God and a higher presence, but don't see the need to put any time and attention into focusing on it. That's kind of like a dynamic that's going on here. A whole land set up that way. Jesus starts talking to her, and immediately this woman throws up barriers. These are barriers of prejudice and ignorance. Jews and Samaritans held a deep animosity for each other. They had long-standing hatreds. The woman said, why are you, a Jew, asking me for a drink? 
There is animosity that she is expressing, and it is characteristic of this relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. And expressing this animosity created that barrier. She wouldn't understand why she was approaching her in the first place because of this prejudice. One of my favorite poets, Maya Angelou, wrote, Prejudice is a burden which confuses the past, threatens the future, and renders the present inaccessible. That's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what she's doing. She is embracing this distorted past that makes the present divine impossible, from her perspective, totally inaccessible. She couldn't meet Jesus because she brought prejudice, preconceived ideas, barriers to the presence of a budding relationship. What about individuals or groups that calls us to bring God's love to them? Do we ever harbor any prejudicial ideas toward them? Do they harbor any prejudicial ideas towards us? It may be an individual or a group of people who rejected because of the color of their skin or their religion or their way of life. God came to the Samaritan woman in the form of someone against whom she was deeply prejudiced. God may come to us in the same way. If we are to experience Jesus, we will have to look into the eyes of those in the face of an individual or group that makes us feel uncomfortable. Throw up barriers. Harbor prejudice. Another barrier the woman erected was that of social custom. In that time, Jewish men and, any t- and with any type of woman did not directly interact in public. A good, upstanding, righteous Jewish man would only talk to his mother, his wife, or his daughters, never to another woman unless there was an elder present. The Samaritan woman embraced the same cultural biases. It was a scandal for Jesus, this Jewish man, to be talking to this strange woman at the well. We would consider it scandalous in our way of thinking. Social customs can separate us from people also. I mean, how many of us know a person who is poor? Do you know a person who is poor, poor in spirit, poor in mind, poor in money? What is their life like? Do we know the names of their children? Do we reach out and help them? In our society today, we segregate on economic status. Middle class people only know middle class people. Rich people only know rich people. And poor people seem to only know poor people. Social customs keep us apart. Do you know someone who is desperately poor? Jesus came to the woman as someone's social customer, came to this woman while someone's social customs made her a stranger. Jesus may come to us and appear as a stranger. The third barrier was that Jesus was an outsider for the Samaritan woman. As I explained a little earlier, Jews did not generally travel through Samaria. Most traveling went out of their way to avoid the Samaritans. To the woman, Jesus was clearly an outsider of her community, an outsider to her way of life, an outsider to her personal experience, and that made it hard for her to take Jesus seriously because it wasn't someone that she had seen and been accustomed to each and every day. Jesus is often an outsider in our own lives. We'd like to make Jesus over into a middle-class American, but he's not. He's different from us. Jesus is deeply and profoundly different from us. His values and ambitions, the way he conducts his life, the way things Jesus carried things about, and the people with whom he cared for are all very different from us. He's an outsider to our way of life. Which means that if we choose to follow him, we discover ourselves becoming different from our neighbors. People and family members we have known our whole lives, if we truly allow the presence and passion of Christ to come in and permeate, they will notice that we are different. They may think that we are strange. This woman was reluctant to be honest with Jesus because he kept asserting his strange presence upon her. He was courageously daring with his love and his grace. Go fetch your husband, he said. And when she said, I have no husband, 
Jesus already knew the truth. She had been married five times and was not married to the man who she was now with. With? I don't know what that means. But it gives me the connotation that it probably wasn't on the up and up. It might have been a relationship of ill repute. He already knew the truth. She knew that she wasn't married to him. But she didn't want Jesus to know this. She wanted to hide this fact from him. She would interact with him on the surface, but when it came to the real death of revealing a secret about herself, she wanted to keep that to herself. All the pain, all the trouble, all the mistakes, all the heartaches of her life, she was trying to keep it to herself, locked up, not letting the beauty of God's grace come in. She was doing this to Jesus. I think we do that as well in our own journeys. We'll all dress up and get all pretty for a Sunday worship, like I did today. But how, what are you laughing at that for? <laughs> how do we relate to Jesus when we're dressed in our finest? How do we relate to Jesus when we go home after church? How do we relate to Jesus when we go to work, when we're angry, when we're frustrated, when we're tired, when we feel beat up? Do we connect with Jesus then? Are we open to God and Christ about the messy parts of our lives, about the parts of our lives that aren't pretty, that aren't pious, that don't appear saintly and holy? Do we share those with our Savior or do we keep them bottled up? We can pray when we're feeling pious. When we're feeling close to God, it's easy to pray to God. When we're feeling close to Jesus, it's easy to celebrate his divine presence. But can we open the parts of our lives to Jesus the way the Samaritan woman eventually did? She found it difficult to do so. But when we revealed the truth of the matter to her, and did it in a way that was loving and caring and not with judgmental condemnation, she saw. And when she saw the Messiah in front of her, she believed. She believed that the Messiah was real. And she believed the Messiah was in front of her, loving her, caring for her, as he encountered and confronted her. Despite all of the barriers the Samaritan woman put forward, this story has a very, very happy ending. This woman eventually connected, and she went back to her village. She stopped the chore that she went for, which was to get water for her household. She left the jar there, and she went back to the village and said, I have met this wonderful, amazing man. Come and meet him. She didn't keep it to herself. She immediately shared it with others. She becomes the first evangelist in all the Gospels. She was the first one who took the message of Jesus to her town, to her community, to her village. Come and meet him. The story says the whole community came out and many believed because of her testimony. The honest, heartfelt, compassionate story that you couldn't help but believe. I believe that we are a world made up of people who are slow to believe. Because we recognize that when we encounter God, when we come face to face with the Spirit, when we hear Jesus calling us and saying us, well, and then fill in the blank, we want to put up a wall. We don't want to take the intentional step to step outside of barriers of our prejudice, of our social customs, of that which we've known a lifetime, and it's easy to predict and to step into a foreign new world in walking with the Savior. I believe at times we use our prejudices to keep Jesus away. 
our fear of outsiders, our reluctance to expose the messy realities of our lives. I believe, though, that we can get past those things that we have experienced with others, and through the power of the gospel and the blood of Jesus, all things, all things can change, can grow, become closer to the way God is calling and wanting it to be. And my hope and prayer for all of you who are hearing this today is that during this Lenten season, as we identify with the various characters, last week with, with uh, oh, correct, Nicodemus, who had the intellectual capacity to understand the power of the Messiah backwards and forwards and rejected it, to the woman at the well who has the social customs and prejudices but overcame them, Jesus broke through it all. My prayer for you in this Lenten season is that whatever you have getting in the way of your spiritual growth, call it blockage, call it a barrier, call it an iron skillet mentality. It means it never breaks, dings, or rusts. It doesn't weaken. That you allow yourself in the slowness to our belief that Yes, God is the God who created the heavens and the earth. Yes, God is the God who calls us. Yes, God is the one who says they love us. To actually take it and apply it to our lives and live it each and every day. But you've got to wrestle with it. And that's what Lent is. A wrestling match between ourselves, our faith, and the God who makes it all. So I hope that you struggle with your barriers this Lenten season, your social customs, your encounter with the outsiders, the being threatened, if you will, by a new way of understanding the power of his love. And I hope that in there, you will reconnect with our Savior, who has a beautiful plan for each and every one of us, a plan of knowledge, a plan of growth, a a plan of expansion, a plan of effectiveness, a plan rooted in his love. But we have to allow him to encounter us, to confront us, to feel uncomfortable, so that we too, like the Samaritan woman, can slowly begin to believe. We all pray with Loving God, we love saying that you are a God of grace and a God of glory. We love saying that you are there when we call on you and that you do amazing things in our lives. But we tend to ignore, O oh God, the fact that not only do you see the glorious things happening, you see the messy things that we're trying to hide. Help us not to hide those things from you. Instead of those places that we say are struggles, failures. Allow them, O oh God. Allow us, O oh God, to see them as opportunities to grow in the power of your mercy, your love, and your grace. Help us to continue to, continue to grow, to believe and rely on you. In your son's precious and holy